Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you everybody for coming. <coughs> My name is Brandon Muramatsu. I work in the Office of Digital Learning. We're here today to hear from the iCampus, uh, about the iCampus Prize presentations for 2015. We have two presenters. Um, first, I'll have VJ uh, come up and say a few words about the iCampus project, some of the history, talk a little bit how we got to the prize where we're at now. Right. So the iCampus project, this was a wonderful partnership that MIT had with Microsoft Research, uh, circa 2000, started, uh, and, uh, uh, and this was to explore some potent uses of education technology to advance teaching and learning, living and learning at MIT. When the project concluded, uh, it was a five-year project, many of the initiatives that you see around campus, and they're still there, they're spawning other initiatives, they're living under Zoom names, think about Teal, iLab, I mean, many of those projects had their genesis in the iCampus uh, initiative. Um, Al Abelson, that you see, Professor Abelson over here, actually was the, the director of the iCampus project. Uh, he helped uh, initiate it at that time. I remember there were three of us uh, uh, with Al uh, John McNanty, who was the dean of the School of Engineering, uh, uh, myself, and uh, uh, through a lot of uh, urging through this gentleman over here, we, we negotiated, we set up projects and so on, which a lot of our faculty participated in. When the project concluded, uh, in fact, the, the project's conclusion led to the formation of an office at MIT called the Office of Educational Innovation and Technology, which was placed in the Dean of Undergraduate Education Office, so that we could look at the sustainment of some of the initiatives that have come out of there, which are beginning to make a particular difference. So when the project concluded, there was some money left. And uh, at that time, through a lot of thinking that uh, uh, the other gentleman over here, <laughs> uh, Paul Oka, who was part of our steering committee for this thing, he and Hal <coughs> predominantly hatched up this wonderful idea, talking about how we might use the little money that was left over and uh, set it up as an endowment. And, uh, use the, the interest or whatever the returns from that to support uh, the kinds of activities that our students do very well, which is engage in innovative technology projects. So to invite and reward and incentivize students' engagement in innovative education technology projects that affected life and learning at the market. So that's what led to this whole award thing, the, the prize. It's had two or three incarnations. The last three years of this work, uh, Brandon has been spearheading, pulling uh, things together, configuring it. So we're very delighted that you're participating in it. We hope we will spread the word around the project also. And uh, your engagement there certainly is of great interest. To do. The one thing I'll add, the projects that have come out of here have actually informed uh, MIT's education technology infrastructure. They've become part of applications, and that's the kind of hope. This year, we have actually taken a different kind of an approach for this project, thinking about uh, you know, having a larger horizon, you know, what, your visions, you know, something that that uh, uh, invites your vision about uh, about living and learning at MIT 20 years since, which is a slight departure from how we had done it before, because they solved more proximal problems before. Right? So anyway, so thank you all for participating. Thank you, Vijay. So Vijay introduced himself, Al Abelson, Paul Oka, um, one other judge, Oliver Thomas from ISNT. And then the person who's been helping me pull all of this together, Kirky DeLong, is in the back along with Ada Ren. So thank you guys very much. Uh, so Vijay said this year is a little bit of a departure from previous years. Um, we're focusing about 20 years out. How might living and learning at MIT be different in 20 years? And so it's my pleasure to introduce the first speaker, William Lee. So William, go ahead and come on up. Well, thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Brian, and thank you to everyone for being here and to all of the organizers uh, for this. I'm really excited to talk about our project, this iCampus Accessibility uh, Project. My name is William Lee. Uh, I'm a student in computer science in CSAIL, and I also worked with Dhruv Jain, who is a student in the Media Lab. And we're both very interested in assistive technologies, in accessible technologies, in technologies that potentially uh, help people with or students with disabilities uh, do more, but also by extension help 
all students on campus or everybody on campus uh, do much more. So what I thought I would start with is imagine that it is 2035. And our vision is that people with diverse abilities of all abilities study, they work, and they live at MIT. And we envision a 2035, 20 years from now, in which every student, regardless of whatever impairment or disability that they have, will be able to fully participate in MIT's campus life, both in the classroom and in all sort of community and extracurricular activities, full, uh, free of physical barriers, free of social stigmas. Uh, that's what we have in mind. So we were encouraged to think 20 years out and really give some concrete examples of what it might be like in 20 years for students with a disability and some of the things that uh, technologies and tools and also attitudes, the things that will have changed and developed by that time. So let me give you just three very short uh, vignettes. First, we can imagine a blind uh, student uh, who, uh, you know, in, in the past might have difficulty uh, in math courses, courses with a lot of equations, a lot of diagrams, and so on. So we can imagine in 20 years uh, time that every student has some kind of personalized or personal tactile tablet that makes it possible to uh, you know, feel uh, diagrams or equations or other uh, sorts of things that often rely on vision. And so they can keep up in calculus, in any uh, kind of math class, in any other class where there's a big vision component. Uh, what's really interesting is that this is a technology that I think is going to extend beyond students with vision impairments, that uh, all students are going to benefit uh, from this. So you know, today, in 2015, we talk a lot about data visualization. But what if you added sort of a sensory or tactile component to that? What if you, know, you could imagine today's visualizations or data visualizations, diagrams, and so on, have a texture component, have a temperature component? How could that enhance learning? The second example I want to give is a student who has hearing loss, who's, who's deaf. And today, uh, students rely on captioning, on cart services that are not perfect. You have somebody who's hired to type 160 words a minute in classes, but it's quite difficult to keep up in math courses, in physics, in, in, in hard science, in all courses, uh, really. But we can imagine that advances in automatic speech recognition and wearable computing and so on make it possible for a deaf student to maybe wear something or uh, have some sort of augmented display uh, so that uh, she can uh, look at the instructor and the blackboard and see all the captions uh, perfectly in real time. And what we'll find, here's another uh, parallel again, that other students who don't have hearing loss uh, will also use this because maybe they're an international student and English is their second language. Or maybe they just find it easier to listen to the instructor and also have uh, captions. Or maybe they find it easier to go home and have a searchable database of everything that happened in lecture annotated uh, really well. The final example I'll give is a student with a mobility impairment with a, who uses maybe a power wheelchair. Maybe he has muscular dystrophy, for example. And being at MIT is really important, and this place-based in-person part is really critical. But maybe some days he's more tired and has difficulty getting to class. But you could imagine that in 20 years' time, you know, sort of telepresence robots are more, co are more commonplace. And so it's much easier for this student on days when he's feeling a little bit uh, down to be able to participate fully in class, in labs, in extracurricular activities uh, that happen across campus. And you can see, again, that this could be applicable to students maybe if they're at a sports tournament or off campus or something like that. You know, the MIT libraries in the future, you, can't, you can, along with being able to check out books, maybe you can check out a telepresence robot or something uh, like that. So these are the things that we imagine in 20 years' time uh, that make it possible for students to fully participate, students with all abilities to fully participate on campus. And there's a big technology component, but I think it also is about changing uh, the culture, the stigma, or, or some of the barriers associated with disability uh, around MIT. Uh, we have some ideas about starting right now, about making it easier to navigate campus when there's a lot of construction, when uh, it might be difficult to find some buildings. And in 20 years' time, I think we can uh, make MIT, within 20 years' time, we can really make MIT a model for accessibility and inclusion, something that will spread across many different campuses, across Boston and beyond. Thank you very much. So we have some time for questions and answers.
Yeah, sure, go ahead. I'm uh, just curious. Uh, in terms of accessibility, do you think accessibility of like non-disabled students will also enhance in 20 years? I think so, yes. Uh, you know, abs absolutely. I think what's really interesting, I think, for me, uh, I've had the chance to do some work in assistive technology, accessible technology, is that oftentimes, um, you know, students with disabilities or people with disabilities are early adopters of technologies that everybody is going to potentially use. So the examples that I, you know, gave of, you know, open captioning in courses, maybe this is helpful for, for all learners, even students who, you know, I guess you don't conventionally define as having um, a disability, or, you know, this robots idea, or um, tactile graphics, that sort of thing. I think this is going to enhance the learning experience. It's going to lead to more personalized uh, learning uh, experiences that sort of maximize everybody's potential. So I think the answer is absolutely yes. Yeah. So you touched on this a little bit with the idea of a telepresence robot. And I found it uh, <clears throat> refreshing that uh, in 20 years, a lot of the interactions you envisioned around education are still in person and you know students going to a room together. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you see the whole uh, online education component either hurting or hindering um, accessibility. So depending on uh, particular disabilities, um, for example, hearing impairment. Yes. Right now it's often a lot easier for a hearing impaired person to interact face to face. Yes. Um, at the same time, we're moving a lot of the, uh, I would say, the lecture pieces, for example, yeah. online. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm really glad you asked this question because, yes, there will be more online components, I imagine, in 20 years, and it's already happening now and already creating some challenges uh, now. Um, so I think some of these uh, technologies in terms of speech recognition or captioning are very applicable uh, to an online education setting. And it's uh, also relevant things like tactile graphics and, and so on. Um, Broadly speaking, it could increase accessibility. Maybe somebody who's across the world or who might have difficulty getting around campus would be able to use online materials. But it is also creating challenges. And uh, so, so I think there's really an opportunity to work on captioning, on work on speech recognition, work on uh, other sort of annotation methods that help people with different impairments to access online materials. Uh, more effectively, uh, make them more accessible. I would go as far as to say that this is really MIT's call to work on this problem, to really address uh, the issues of accessibility in online education uh, materials, uh, materials that uh, might be difficult to access for somebody with a hearing impairment, someone who's blind. Um, we can do a lot better, and we can lead the way uh, in terms of the accessibility of online education. Yes. Uh, again, this is uh, sort of uh, picks up from Oliver's point about place-based education. Now here yeah. at MIT, we talk a lot about doing stuff, not just going reading, conversing, but actually lots of tactile experiences yes. building the you know mm -hmm. thing. So um, and so there's a whole class of learners where their disabilities get in the way of all the stuff that we call active learning. Yes. Right? So do you see, can you, can you project from the kinds of things that you're doing how they might be facilitated? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think our broad vision is that any student with a disability, when they come to MIT, should be able to study whatever major they want. They shouldn't be restricted from studying mechanical engineering because they can't use the machine shop. They shouldn't be restricted from studying math because they can't see the equations, that sort of thing. So this opens up a really uh, interesting set of questions and challenges and opportunities when it comes to accessible labs, accessible maker spaces, accessible machine shops, accessible you know, uh, uh, equipment, that kind of thing. Um, Personally, I see these as, 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 yeah, really big opportunities, research opportunities, development opportunities to really figure out uh, how to make, uh, you know, different, you know, physical labs or, or, you know, chemical engineering labs, that sort of thing, accessible. So that anybody with any impairment or regardless of their ability can, can choose any major, any area of engineering or science that they 
that they want to. So uh, I think in the near term, there's both in the near term and the long term, there's some interesting problems uh, or, or approaches to work on. You can envision sort of next generation technologies, and we can also do things today to make sure that our labs have adjustable tables, or uh, that all equipment is accessible, or that you know the software that we use in labs are screen reader accessible, that sort of thing. So I think there's many things that we can be well, doing. Let's talk more yeah. about tactile, because mm -hmm. uh, you talk about Apple devices. Things that require tactile experiences. Yeah, so I think if we go with this, um, just to take this telepresence robots example, uh, a little bit further. I think today there already are some telepresence robots. They can go to conferences and uh, you can go around campus, that sort of thing. But there is no tactile component associated with that. So you could imagine in 20, within 20 years' time uh, some haptic component with this so that somebody remotely can do some sort of um, physical fabrication or do some kind of uh, lab. So that's going to be some sort of input that they'll be able to control from home or wherever they are, as well as some kind of uh, output effectors, basically, that let them manipulate equipment or, or do something. I think that's a really interesting uh, area to think about and to work on. Yeah. What about working with a uh, brain interface you know, to like recreate the environment or MIT in their minds and not necessarily uh, a physical? Thing? Yeah, I mean, we'll see within 20 years whether this will uh, happen. But I think uh, one of the um, areas I've certainly been interested been interested in, and one area is there are uh, there are some uh, people, some students who have severe disabilities and have effectively locked in uh, syndrome. And there is a lot of progress being made these days in brain computer interfaces that you can imagine being able to control a computer or being able to control some kind of robot or being able to control uh, some some other sorts of uh, interfaces uh, for sure. So I don't imagine yet, you know, recreating the whole palace of MIT in your head. I suppose. But I think being able to control um, your environment just with, with some sort of BCI, with some sort of brain-computer interface, is a really interesting uh, thing to envision, a really interesting thing to explore. Maybe one more question? Oh, yeah. It's not really a question, just, just a comment. Yeah. Um, you know, there's just tremendous potential here. Part of the message is students who are at MIT that you can participate, but I think there's an even stronger message for MIT to be symbolic of the fact that if you are disabled, that is not at all an obstacle to studying at a university like MIT. We have an enormous impact on kids growing up. So I, I just, it's not a question, it's just a, just a, you know, a real compliment on the vision you predicted. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is very much MIT's call, and I think MIT really can be a model for, uh, uh, for accessibility and inclusion. Um, when it, come, and when it comes to technology and when it comes to sort of the whole culture of this campus, for sure. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks. And it's my pleasure to introduce the next group for the iCampus Prize. Hi. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful opening presentation. Hi, my name is John. Uh, I'm Colin. And we have here uh, Sam Gabriel, also on the team. And we are A14Z, also now known as the uh, idealistic undergrad team. <laughs> uh, so a little bit of a history lesson here. Uh, in the mid-1970s, uh, the first commercially successful portable computer came out. Uh, 20 years after that uh, was the first modern laptop with color display, Wi-Fi uh, connectivity. About 10 years after that came the first smartphone with multi-touch. Uh, five years after that came the first successful wearable device uh, with the Pebble. And then about two years after that, the dev kit came out for the Oculus Rift, which kicked off a huge virtual reality headset craze. Uh, that is what I call exponential growth, and that is our history. So that's how exponential growth has influenced us in the past. But let's take a minute and look at how it's going to influence the future. Now, if current estimates hold, the estimates are that in just by 2020, your $1,000 computer will be able to emulate a human brain. And by the year 2035, it'll take a village of humans to match just an $1,000 silicon chip. And by the year 2050, if current estimates and the current amount of Moore's laws hold, then it is estimated that $1,000 worth of computing will buy you the computing power of the entire human race. Now, that's a little insane, and that's a little hectic. And I know it's going to sound completely, art, completely insane, so please don't get lost yet. But if you actually take what we've actually seen, if you actually recognize how far we've come since like this, then you can really recognize 
the power of these exponential curves. And so with respect to that, we'll analyze what the future will be like in much less MIT's position in the smaller increments of 5, 10, 20 years to actually provide a perspective on what the future actually might be like. So we'll analyze this in three major topics. We'll analyze virtual reality, brain-machine interfaces, and lastly, we'll touch on some idea that we're calling the web of concepts as of right now. So first, looking to five years. All right, very good. So uh, we mentioned virtual reality as something that's just emerging right now. And in a lot of ways, this is sort of the logical endpoint for a lot of personal computing, uh, because it can simulate uh, any visual display and any auditory signals uh, you know, to arbitrary complexity. So you can actually, uh, once you get those two things right, you can just simulate the act of using a laptop or a smartphone entirely in a virtual environment. So you can see it's sort of a, it's sort of a superset of what exists right now uh, in sort of this, this interesting logical endpoint. So like we said, five years down the line, first commercial VR headset will be released. Uh, it's going to have high definition graphics, sound. It'll be able to render environments uh, in high fidelity. Uh, there's a couple of things it won't be able to do well, which is actually emulating human to human interactions in a virtual environment. You probably won't be able to manipulate objects, which is touching on the haptic uh, component of this. Uh, and, but you know, regardless of those weaknesses, uh, which we think will get solved down the line, uh, there's certainly going to be a uh, much greater demand for sort of interactive digital content. So everything uh, that can be taught can be taught better when you're sort of uh, leveraging the full scale of our awesome sensory capacities. Uh, right now, looking at this small rectangle LCD screen, that's not using our potential to its fullest. And we weren't evolved to stare at screens. We evolved to exist in three-dimensional environments, manipulate things, uh, and, and learn and react that way. So uh, we're talking about really high quality digital content, you know, the Khan Academy of VR. And we're moving away from the green check marks on MITx. Um, and so as machines get smarter and smarter, and we're trying to build up this library, uh, we foresee that it's going to become really important to have human knowledge in a machine-readable format uh, as sort of the back end of these sorts of devices. So uh, that's what we're calling the web of concepts, which you touched on. Uh, and it's a very difficult problem. There's obviously uh, a lot of ways to take what we currently teach in primary schools uh, and modularizing it into concepts and trying to map the sort of dependencies of those concepts is not an easy problem. Uh, and you know, the amount of computing power to sort of uh, to analyze all these concepts and to sort of like linearize them into learning pathways and to understand all their interconnections scales as n squared. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of computation that goes into that. And I think uh, the demand for this and the, cap the computational capability will start emerging in the near future. So five years out, we imagine high school level material uh, and, and prior to that will all be put into a sort of machine-readable format in this web of concepts. Yeah. And beyond that, it literally grows exponentially. So we expect within the next five years after that to actually be able to see this web of concepts that, drew, that Colin touched upon to really exponentially grow in size. It will start to in encompass a large amount of online material and university-level material that's currently populating like MITx and OCW and other stuff. Imagine taking a concept and just reducing it to literally bare minimum, bare linear steps that would actually enable you to do really complex tasks, but really easy. Imagine if like you ask someone like how to do your laundry and like they had to teach you how to build like a washing machine. That's terrible. But what if like you could teach someone to build a particle collider by telling them each step that they actually just have to do and like compressing the task into an infinitely shorter period of time. Furthermore, the online reality we believe will become ubiquitous and cheap by this period in time, and so will enable large-scale universities and large-scale institutions to leverage these abilities, to give accessibility to people, to allow people to go to a $60,000 university by buying a $100 headset. And that's a really powerful tool, and that really will change the future of education. But that's just within five years. And like talking past that, it literally goes really cool and really awesome. Uh, this is representing our vision for 20 years out, so we're finally now in 2035. Uh, by this point, we imagine that virtual reality, uh, at least for audiovisual inputs, can uh, basically mimic any sort of human interaction to the point where it's more or less indistinguishable from uh, an in-person, non-virtual interaction. Uh, and by that point in time, we think that uh, the only logical direction for MIT to go is to either augment the physical campus with a virtual one, uh, if not get rid of the virtual campus entirely. Uh, so that's going to physical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Physical. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, it, you can do a lot of things in the virtual environment. I mean, it doesn't have to be tied to the way that MIT's campus currently looks. And you can have any department and any building and any facility you want just by rendering it in software. Uh, and that, that's, that's fascinating. The, the thing is, MIT can stay the same institution it is now by being selective and only allowing certain people into this virtual environment, regardless of that. So, uh, and by the bottom right here, we have the web of concepts, which uh, could feasibly be, uh, it could subsume the vast majority of human knowledge 
uh, at this point. And that's a tall order, but uh, it's some amazing things fall out of that. So it can actually start guiding research directions. And we'll be able to see the gaps in uh, the knowledge that's you know, currently had by humanity. And that's really amazing. So it's kind of insane within perspective a lot of these changes. And the question is, like, what will MIT, what will it be like to be here? What will it be like to be a student here? And the answer is, like, it's strongly dependent on what MIT does to actually adapt and deal with these changes. Like, if it doesn't remain at like, the forefront, if it doesn't accept like, virtual technology, how it will literally, like, the next generation of people will literally be very, like, very used to like going and talking to friends with like by putting on a pair of glasses or like by immersing themselves in something, then like if MIT doesn't accept that, it will literally be destroyed by these exponential curves. But yet, if it harnesses that, if it actually makes that ability, if it leverages it, becomes a top university, if it helps found this web of concepts, then it actually has the ability to do so much more with respect to a lot of this, and it has the ability to be a top tier university. MIT might change a lot in 20 years, and like the future, like let's be honest, no one really knows. But at least one thing can stay the same if we actually make and that's and that's like the culture and the people here. And that's ultimately what MIT has, and I hope that that's what it is in 20 years as well. Thanks, guys. Any questions? Can I ask, with all this virtual reality, I mean, one of the big things I hear about MIT is that it's all about collaborative learning. Yeah. And I don't know how you collaboratively learn if you're not in the same room. I mean, it, the, the virtualness seems so isolated. I mean, yeah. you know, I'm misunderstanding how it actually works. Well. It's not misunderstanding, it's, uh, but it's really hard to break out of what the technology is at present. And you're spot on for current VR. Uh, it's absolutely, it can't render faces well. Yeah. There's going to be lag between the conversations. Okay. All those technical problems go away. Okay. Uh, so it, it, it's going to be uh, entirely fluid as soon as you can transmit you know, uh, the exa exactly what a person looks like. And this room can just be of infinite resolution uh, in a VR headset. And it's going to be entirely indistinguishable. But you're still collaboratively being able to interact and yeah. enjoy each other's personas. Interact well with the same the objects. Experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Virtually, not physically, virtually. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I, know. I mean, you guys could pick but up see, the same I don't wires. Because like they don't give me a hug. You no, know, <laughs> but I mean, I'm serious. Like I mean, they don't love me enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just not for five years. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's. We uh, the haptics. Haptics is totally yeah. a black hole. Uh, the thing is. The sense of touch, it's sort of this novelty detector, and you don't really accept large amounts of information. I mean, how many times throughout the day do you think about the clothes on your back? Clothes on your back. So you know, certainly audio and visual are the senses by which uh, information is, is processed, especially by you know, your actual formal logical processes. Now, uh, extending this just slightly, um, I don't know how much you want to go past 20 years. But I, I believe the really revolutionary technology uh, will be in terms of the, what's on the top in terms of brain machine human brain machine interfaces right so like actually being able to have the ability of interfacing your brain with like a physical computer not just controlling it but even more than that and so with respect to this like two technologies that are like absolutely beautiful and absolutely awesome there's like an EEG which currently can like measure brain and electrical activity in it and then there's a TMS which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation and like what transcranial magnetic stimulation is it can induce localized electric currents anywhere in the brain like currently technology is like 3 inches deep but like Hopefully in the future it'll go farther, and like I definitely expect that. Like by 20 years, it'd be awesome. So what that means ultimately is you can induce senses inside of someone's brain completely electrically and completely artificially. So like literally, you could just be sitting there, and you could be like, I wonder what a carrot tastes like, and like eat a carrot for the first time, right? And so like if you were trying to talk to another person or like engage with them as you're talking about, imagine if you had a way to read someone's brain and electrical pulses, and then actually effectively communicate them to the other people. Like the joke that I generally tell to people is like my girlfriend always says that like I don't understand her, but like maybe with this technology, right? You could actually understand. You can actually communicate with people effectively. Way, way too <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and like in terms of tactile and stuff, it's cool. And really fast, if you want to tie that back to some other current research, we've already got uh, optogenetics sort of taking off, where you can stimulate neurons optically with lasers, which the beam width of a laser can be less than the size of a neuron by a long shot. There's also uh, there's nan uh, micro robots right now. Uh, I'm personally next year going to be working on research, uh, which is magnetic nanoparticles that you can localize in the body uh, wirelessly using magnetic fields. So, that's what I want to, so in this telepathic scenario. Huh? The yeah. The okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> so um, the question. I actually have two questions. But, uh, so one is, I, I, it's, it's a lovely vision, the telepathic scenario. So if you think about this uh, one brain. Operate, interoperating with yours, right? 
in a telepathic scenario, do you think there's some agent in between that's needed or is this? Yeah. So this because you keep talking about brain to machine, yeah. as if the agency of, of something else is needed in this. Broker. A broker is needed. Right? Yeah, so, so that's kind of an interesting question. Like, is there an arbiter, is there a broker need? <laughs> no, that, that's a very fascinating no, question. That's, that's a really good question. And um, I guess, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm naive, and I'm optimistic. And I believe that our brain is good. And I believe our brain is good at computation. Because there's a lot of cosmic literature that says you don't. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, OK, but we'll come to another question. Yeah. My worry, I'll tell you, the worry is uh, something when you s talk about this web of concepts and everything is happening, one of the nice things about education, some things that you want, a thing that you want to keep an invariant, is that things are not opaque. And you know how to get to a, a problem resolution you know, you take a path, you take very yeah. conscious steps towards finding out things, you know? Mm -hmm. And if everything happening happens magically, there's a degree of opacity, you know, which I believe uh, you know, might, might not be what education is about. And I would argue um, a better analogy would be more of like a, a wiki type model, where like it's always completely in flux, if if, I, if that's what you mean. Um, and we certainly don't want to say, you know, tell students this is the hierarchy of human knowledge. We've derived it from first principles, and any questioning of it is treason. You know, because uh, that's clearly not going to be the case. It's going to be a continual work in progress, and the connections being made between the various points uh, is always going to be in flux, and more and more nodes are going to be appended all the time. So that's you know, it's de it's definitely going to going to be sort of collaborative effort on the part of like all of humanity. Yeah. Uh, your question touches on some really good stuff. Well, actually, if we take a hell, go ahead first, please. So, sorry, two questions. Um, I inferred from what you said that you thought that MIT 20 years from now, with all of this technology, would still be a pretty uh, exclusive place in terms of the number of people who are going. What, what's your actual image? What do you, what do you think the yeah. size of the student body? in? 20 years from now at MIT, you know, what to be given this, this kind of. I do not imagine it will increase. Uh, I disagree with that one. Really? <laughs> yeah. Really? Okay, there, go there, ahead. Okay, you first, and then I'll give my justification on it. So there's absolutely no logistical constraints anymore. So you could easily take on arbitrary numbers of students. Uh, Wait, you mean on the physical but, campus? No, no, it's no. Should. However right, so you consider going MIT, what, what do you think it should be? Sure, and I, and I think as these tools uh, emerge, the average degree of education across the world is going to be increasing. The rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, and so I can easily imagine uh, hundreds of thousands of students a year being qualified to come to MIT. But what do and you then, think it should be? Right? Uh, probably. You're the, you're the dean of admissions, right? You're the president. What do you think it should be? Like, throw out a number, like a million. A million MIT students uh, at one time, so like 250,000 a year. And that's because there's going to be more professors as well, because research is going to be aided by uh, technology we didn't even touch on. Uh, and you know, every, every, the average person in the world is going to have probably you know, an extra four more years of education on average. I just pulled that number out of nowhere. But all of these people will be flooding into universities. Um, and MIT absolutely needs to be able to grow organically. You disagree or so wait, do you mean for the physical campus, or you mean MIT as like a as an institution? In oh, well, then I completely wait. You talking physical or like as an institute, like as a complete global institution? As the whole institution. Oh yeah, then I completely agree with you. Um, I'm talking about in terms of physical campus. I believe the physical campus will become less and less uh, necessary for undergraduates, as as like as Colin talked about, like increasing access to education will make it less and less lucrative to pay like ex huge amounts of do dollars in order to go to an institution like MIT when you can literally get it by like buying like a headset or like going to another institution, right? Like already we're seeing like online education and stuff. Like we're seeing the sprouting up of like vocational schools and like huge amounts of like schools and stuff. Education is like very becoming really accessible. So I think in terms of the physical campus, it will become less and less lucrative for people to come for undergraduates. If the community aspect is not held, if the community aspect is held really well, I think it can maintain. Um, but in terms of like global institution, absolutely, like it's going to grow. The amount of people engaging with it like virtually online and stuff will be exponential. So in terms of that, yeah, I think a million people will like go through MIT a year, but not actually be on the campus at all. And it's a tough to see all the moving parts and how they interact. But like, I can with virtual reality, I can imagine eliminating the problem of students in primary school being bored in class, because everything can be put into such an engaging format. It'll all be you know, 
uh, environments and like scenarios they have to solve uh, that are barely different from Call of Duty, you know, uh, in how they feel to the student, and they'll be able to uh, to learn all this completely fluidly because it's no longer you know trying to force information in an overly abstract form until they're ready for it. Had a hand up here. This image, your your presentation, and I'm focusing on the image above and the idea that you are able to be a machine to be the brain. This transforms the whole idea of education. In the lower grades, the high school and so on, we're, we're taught formulas to apply. Um, a plus B equals C, A squared, whatever, you know, gives a... No longer will it be that knowledge as much as the computer will have that knowledge. The person will act almost like the artist, intuitively so that the idea of education is going to be much more creativity rather than performance. It's going to be much more towards the idea of intuition and focusing on that solution down the road that one keeps using the computer as the tool to arrive at. You have a vision. You have a vision the computer is is your tool, is your pencil. You're no longer drawing something now, you're using the computer to actually draw it, to actually execute it. It's pretty scary. And scary is not the word. It's pretty optimistic, pretty, using your term, pretty exciting. Is it, absolutely, I completely agree with you. Uh, I think in a lot of aspects we're already seeing that though in a lot of areas, right? Like, like for instance, I remember the story. There's a TED talk by a guy who like made a company called Nobath, and he, at least he says it. And what he did is he made the entire business plan. He did all the chemical formulations from his phone in the middle of Africa without going to any higher education, without going into any institution. So within that respect, I think like he was just using the tool of like what the computer was offering, and he was just the artist that was like patching the chemical formulas together. Everybody. Everybody will be, um, using an analogy, everybody will be a poet, everybody yeah. will be a writer, everybody will be a painter, everybody will be an engineer because of the opportunity of utilizing uh, the conversation with the machine. I completely agree. Uh, <laughs> wow. No, <laughs> even. That's scary. I'm going to process that all night. I'm curious whether or not this technology will serve the people who do have handicaps and that they can't hear or see. Obviously, definitely the ones who are mobilely impaired because then they don't have to go anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm curious whether um, the tapping into the brain will bypass any of these handicaps. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it undeniably will. If you reach the point where you can... Uh, say have like neuron level control and be able to understand how memories are just sort of uh, firings of, of certain patterns of neurons in the brain. Uh, not to mention, you know, senses are uh, even easier than memories potentially because you sort of know where the uh, inputs are coming in and we're already able to make artificial corneas, things like that. Um, and you sort of know where those, sen those signals originate. Um, so all sorts of amazing things can happen once you figure so that out. Only as good as your microchip? <laughs> I think it's all the cloud. So uh, yeah, yeah. I guess. So on the on the flip side, so you know, twenty years ago was nineteen ninety five. So you know, I'm, I'm old enough. I feel old. <laughs> I was tempted to begin this song I mean, I'm, with the I'm Ace old of enough, I'm old enough that I can remember nineteen ninety five, yeah. and I can remember what MIT felt like in nineteen ninety five, and I can kind of remember what students were like in nineteen ninety five, and it wasn't all that different. Right? And the question, so the question is, you know, seriously, are you, are you sort of betting on the exponential happening and that when I think about the difference over the last 20 years, I shouldn't, I shouldn't get trapped into a kind of linear exponent, linear, linear extrapolation? Because you know, you're talking about something that's vastly, vastly different in 20 years. Mm -hmm. Right? So, you know, do you actually mean, mean that seriously? Right, because we all know about Moore's Law and all the curves and all that. Are you actually s saying there's going to be such an enormous difference that we really are in a place where we're seeing the not just the not just uh, the exponential in Moore's Law, 
right? But the actual exponential and the size of the effects that are happening. You know, is that is that kind of kind of your argument? That's the argument. And you know, you can you can see this as a thought experiment of we expect to see this ongoing exponential uh, in the price performance of computing. Uh, but remember that happened over the last twenty years too. Right. Yeah. I think it's where we come in the past twenty years. And we're suddenly in exponential growth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. frankly, just looking at uh, the internet alone in, over the past 20 years, I mean. Uh, well, the internet was there in 1985. No, it was. I think it started taking off in 1992. In 1992. <laughs> but when you look at ease of access. No, no, but the question <laughs> was so there is exponential. Yeah. We've been into, but the impact, as I said, the student is not remarkably different, let's say. Right? Yeah. So I, what, uh, what's going to, what's the, what's the, the secret sauce? Is that just suddenly yeah. there's. You know, a typical on exponentials, there's suddenly a point where it becomes almost discontinuous. That's also, you know, typical of exponential growth. Yeah, so is that sort of sort of what you're saying? I think it's there's there's quanta, uh, qualitative changes that happen as a result of the quant uh, you know quantitative ongoing exponential, uh, and I think they absolutely have happened in the past 20 years. I mean, in 1999 was when you know. Steve Jobs got a whole crowd of people to stand up and clap because he put a hula hoop through a you know through a laptop because it had Wi-Fi. Uh, not to mention just the size and amount of the information on the internet. I mean, Wikipedia was nothing to speak of in 1995. Now it's by far the greatest uh, central but also crowdsourced repository of all of human knowledge. I mean, these these things exist, and you could argue they're not being leveraged their full potential. I could name some other things that I think are uh, nonlinear jumps, like the fact that. You know, computers are the first, uh, you know, just based on interactivity uh, alone. There's ways that you can learn using a computer that have never been possible using any passive medium. But it hasn't changed what it's like to be at MIT. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's why, like, there's, there's three areas of change that we believe are fundamentally coming to head. One is educational philosophies and paradigms. We believe that there's a large shift in the educational sphere right now, literally right now, that has not happened before to a more individualized project center's experiential ability of learning. Like for instance, Teal is like a, 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 an example of this. So many vocational schools are an example of this. There's a large push in like a lot of educational sectors to try and emphasize this amount of like learning by doing instead of just like learning by like passively sitting and listening. So that's one change that's really coming to head. And I think that educational philosophy, that educational shift will strongly change what it means to be at MIT. Second is the technology. The technology is mainly what we covered a lot of. But if you think about what this technology would mean for a student, what it would mean to be like at MIT, what it would mean is that you wouldn't actually have to be at MIT, right? Like that would literally change the campus. That would fundamentally change it. If you could interact with students like here, or if you could interact with anyone by putting on a glasses, imagine like you're in a lab, right? And you want to be able to run experiments, or you want to be able to run autonomous stuff, and putting on like a headset, or like engaging a program <laughs> that inter that like fully immerses you into like the middle of like India or somewhere, where another lab going cross curricular, like going cross university to do research and stuff for collaboration and stuff. That's an immense benefit we've never seen before. Like currently, like right, like if you're trying to work on a paper, like if you want to talk to the other people, you have to get on a plane, fly thousands, of, not talk to them, but actually see what they're doing. You have to like fly thousands of miles. That's changing right now. Like that's not technology that like we've really had before to actually get like fully engaged, fully immersed, right? Like Skype didn't really exist like 10 years ago even. And so like, for in, and so those are the two things. And the last thing that we really think is really fundamentally changing is cognitive psychology. There's a large amount of developments and a lot of advancements in the field of cognitive science that have showed different approaches and different aspects to learning. For instance, there was a study just released in, a little bit ago in the American Scientific Journal that talked about how curiosity, it's not just this cool emotion. It doesn't just make you feel like you have butterflies in your stomach. It actually makes you retain and learn information better. That's incredible. Imagine if you went to a class and the professor began it by like, instead of giving you a lecture on entropy, he just spilled a cup of coffee over to the ground and said, explain that, right? Like that's fascinating. So what that means is like, if you engage all these changes, these threefold changes, it will really fundamentally change what it means to be at MIT. And I think that's what our point is. Short answer is we do expect to see exponential changes. Time for one more or are you done? On that note, I'm going to say thank you guys. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Around to the Thank you. Uh.